conversations is what drives our business, right? Knowing what are your pain points, what keeps them up at night, where are the problems coming in that they're facing. For me, when I started, I didn't have that. So I needed to figure out what kept them up at night. I also needed to figure out what is super important to them. You seek information. And the information in the real estate industry is is terrible. That's out there. I mean, once you get your license, that's it. The degree in marketing came all based on researching webinars, podcasts, listening to people smarter than me, right? And then from there, it just went into retargeting and funnels, all the things that I think somebody should have a basic knowledge for, for running a small business. Because at the end of the day, real estate is, we are small business owners. So as a small business owners, how many hats are we wearing in our business? So you do need to have that general knowledge on so many of the hats before I give my hat to somebody else. How can I learn more? Watch what somebody else was doing. Why are they doing it? How can I learn about it? What's the reason behind it? I'm a big white person. It made sense then piecing it together. But yeah, there's nobody that pieces it together for you. You're listening to the number one real estate podcast in the world where we talk with real estate professionals all across North America about their wins, losses, lessons, stories help you win in your local market today. My name is Cody from Sheridan Street. I am joined with Vikram Deal of the Real Estate Sales Academy. Vikram Deal, Friday. A long Friday. weekend we're recording. Yeah, Friday. You know, yep. it's got to be Friday. Where, where you told me we we chatted uh, last night. I think last night or two nights ago about uh, where you're headed in the world. Uh, you are, the, you're you're leaving. Visit my brother's baby tomorrow in Cleveland, exciting. Ohio. It's exciting, uh, Cleveland, Ohio. Hey, are your parents going there too? Are your parents are going to be yeah. in Cleveland? The, uh, my my mom and dad were like, "Hey, we're going to go to Cleveland," and I'm like, "Why, why are you guys going this weekend?" and and when are you coming back? Like, we're coming back Tuesday. I'm like, dad's taking off three days of work. He's a new man. Like, he became a grandpa and he's taking off a week of work nonstop. And, uh, and then my mom goes, it's 4th of July weekend. So he's only taking off a couple days. And I was like, ah, mm, God, just there. Yeah, had it, headed back to America. Hanging out, hanging out with the deal family. Well, tell, tell your parents I said hi. Tell your brother yeah. I said hi. Really, uh, that's exciting. You know, like, yeah. excited you're headed back to your favorite place on, on earth. Yeah. What it, <laughs> What are you up to? You make it. You made me seem like I hate America with that comment, bro. Like uh, that's ruthless. Uh, where where are you at? I'm uh, I'm currently in Bogota, Colombia. For being such a smart, funny guy, anybody <laughs> punched you in the back of the head recently? No, two weeks ago that happened, but we already chatted about that. Like that's uh, that happened in Bogota, Colombia, but uh, we won't chat about that. Currently in Bogota. And uh, headed to Medellin next week. Uh, really excited to be in some warmer weather uh, because Bogota is chilly. It's not like super cold, but it's like it's kind of chilly. So I'm here hanging out, spending Canada Day, Canada Day tomorrow for all my Canadian real estate friends. Uh, happy Canada Day tomorrow. Whenever you're listening to this, uh, nobody be, cares about Canada. Well, you know, like uh, there's a lot of people that there's about 33 million people that care about Canada. And that's how many 33 million people that live in Canada. You, you're one of those and you consider yourself one third Colombian and one third Indian. So you don't even care about your own country. You're a minority in your own country these days. I just want I just want the listeners to know what they're dealing with here. Have some integrity, bro. I have tons of integrity, <laughs> but uh, yeah, we uh, we're, we have a guest with us today, uh, Vikram Diol. Uh, we uh, got intro- introduced to Janine from our friend Party Marty, Party Marty Reinhardt, Marty Marty, Marty Reinhardt. Like, uh, but uh, that episode that we recorded with uh, Marty was a ton of fun, and we went real, real deep into uh, into healing. And uh, today, I'm excited to go into some tactical things. Uh, that you can implement it in your real estate business. We were chatting in the green room with Janine prior to Janine's out of the Chicago area about uh, some really cool things she's doing in her local market to really, and she has the numbers and the and the facts to to back it up. Janine, why don't you share with us really quickly, high level uh, bird's nope, eye view? No nope half- pressure either. Cody really yeah. layered on the pressure. She's got the stats and the facts, like really layering on the pressure, Cody, like unnecessary. <laughs> well, you know, like she told me she had the stats ready, but uh you know, we're going to share them, but why don't you give us a high level overview on how you got into real estate and uh, why you chose this profession? <laughs> because it's not easy. So give us the high level overview. Welcome, everybody. So excited to be here. But I got the stats. Totally. I got the stats. Actually, I'm just coming out of, um, you know, what we're going to talk about today. And cool. Oh, 
Look the sound effect, including how I ended up with five listings from that strategy we're going to dive into today. So that'll be a fun one because we all need listings, right? So, but some people do, some people don't. Some people are scared of listings, actually. Well, you know, they have they can pick up buyers. You can get buyers with this too. But uh, <laughs> I got licensed in 2015 after going into an interview for early childhood education. That's where my background is from. Um, always wanted to be with my kids. That field, sadly, is way, way, way underpaid for the work that it, these educators are doing with our kids. And I ended up in real estate this way on a detour and uh, haven't looked back since. So that's really the you know overview. Didn't grow up here. Didn't have a sphere. Um, kids were little, so there was no, you know, oh, let me help you sell your friend's mother's house or any of that. So didn't have that. And then I married into a family where there was already a real tour for my husband. And, um, you know, without wanting awkward Thanksgiving dinners, I decided it was not really a good idea to ask for business there. And I had to figure out how do I find myself business without a sphere, without really knowing a lot about the area and um, fell into geographic farming and have been doing that almost since I started right off the gate in 2015. So, so let's jump. Let's start. Yeah, let's start here. I'm going to start here. Sorry. Cody, 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 hold on. Hold on. Hold on, Cody. So let's start off here. And uh, you like that transition <laughs> right over you? Uh, no, I think no. we're going to ask the same question. But uh, you got into geographic farming in 2015. Ish. Did you? Okay. What kind of budget were you working with? So I got my license in 15. I really didn't get into the farming aspect per se in 15, but I started off was the event we're going to talk about. And okay. the first two years, I essentially did everything, right? I tried a little bit here, a little bit there, all over the tri-state, and I was exhausted. Yeah, uh, sounds exhausting. Right? So after that, I really continued on with the event and just went all in because it was working. So, it, we, should, so we, should, we should talk about the event. What do you think, Cody? Part of the event. We should talk about how the event le led you into where you're at now. And so- What's the event? So I host a community garage sale for me to lead generate. And <clears throat> so let's let's go real granule and real like third grade level here. You host a community event and your community event is a garage sale for the community. How do you even like come about marketing this? And like, is it one, is it one open, like one garage sale or is it like, Everybody pulls out all their crap and you market the crud out of it. Like, how do you do this? So let's um, I give you the backstory on it. Okay. Right? Between kids, me and my husband loved going to garage sales on weekend to just get out of the house, look around. Essentially, it's the window shopping, right? It's the retail therapy if you don't want to necessarily buy stuff. <laughs> and uh, he likes to find the odd things um, and, you know, the weird stuff. And um, we're not talking like, oh, it's a dollar item. I mean, I've had a Corvette pulling up into my garage from a garage. Oh. So you just, you know, garage sales, people have this thing in their mind of like garage sale is junk, it's stuff. But there's actually some real interesting things that people will sell because it's just that. It's just a platform for you to sell your stuff. Just like the MLS is a platform for you to sell your houses. Now you can also put a for sale by owner sign in there. You could also go into town at the bar and say, I'm done with my house. I'm going to sell it. <laughs> but the next person might buy it, right? It's a platform. That's all it is. So the garage sale started out because I really wanted to do something. And I'm like, well, why don't I organize a community garage sale? And the way it works is I had... Year one, again, zero marketing dollars, no budget whatsoever. And I printed 100 flyers and said, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I have 100 flyers. I'm going to bring them to the 100 nearest neighbors next to me. And I asked, hey, I would love to organize a garage sale. The more people in a concentrated area, the more traffic you will get. Because people don't want to stop just for one sale because, you know, that's a waste of time. We like to stop at places where there's maybe like two, three, or when you see multifamily anything clustered. And that was what started this entire event in year one. And I had 10 people say, this is a great idea. 90 people said no. I mean, talk about, you know, the no people, don't focus on those. But 10 people said yes. And that very first event, we had 10 people. And then from there, word spread of, hey, there is a community garage sale. And then we grew. 
and we grew. And um, we are typically now anywhere between 150 to 200 people for that one weekend that are saying yes. So that is now in year nine as we're recording this. And it just has been become a, a community event. And I'll go into like the details. I can talk about this stuff for hours, literally for hours. So, but that's what it is. It's in their driveways. Okay. Most often it's single family homes or townhomes. So we don't have condos. Um, so it's in their garages or in their driveway if the garage is full because suburban living, oftentimes the garage turns into storage, right? So you have to bring it out into the driveway and people will just open up and start selling their stuff. Can you walk me back to the moment where you started, I'm guessing, knocking on doors and talking about like, how did the, how did you get the people to even... <laughs> How did you get the people to even consider to do this community type garage sale? Because if you're saying it's in the, if it's in the actual community, uh, you're obviously want a bunch of people in a specific area running that garage sale and you're kind of the figurehead. So how did you start the process in order to create this community event? Okay. So it was a flyer, okay, regular piece of paper flyer printed at my office. And it really just said that I wanted to start a community garage sale. Here's the proposed date. If you want to participate, email me. That's how simplistic it started. And just dropped those off on the doorsteps. And I just dropped it off at the doorstep because by nature, I am an introvert. Um, I don't door knock. I don't cold call. It's not in the nature of my business, never how I built my business. So it was literally just stick it in the doorframe and run and hope they will not open the door to talk to me. Okay. Like literally, yes, I know. I, th- I I think we can help you with a few talk tracks so that <laughs> your your introverted side could become a little less introverted. Actually, some of the best salespeople are introverts because they're they're so nervous about what they're going to say. They study a lot more than extroverts. Okay, so you and business owners are introverts. So. so so you so you you knocked on the door and you ran as fast as you possibly. <laughs> no, you didn't even knock on the door. You I literally opened, no no no. I opened the screen door because you know Midwest living, so a screen door and then regular house door. So I opened the screen door, stuck the flyer in between the screen door and the door. I mean, you got to be careful. Don't make too much noise, or they might <laughs> not put it in there and then go to the next house. Okay, so then you got some you got some email. Because you're introverted, so you don't want people to talk to you because so you got emails. I got emails. So these emails were people that said, yes, I will participate. And what I did was I just sent them an update of like, hey, we now have three people participating. Tell your neighbors about it. Hey, we now have five people participating. And my very first garage sale map um, that I did was literally a map I printed out off of Google. I took one of my kid's crayons, one of the red crayons, and I outlined the general area that I wanted this garage sale to be in. I'm like, if you live here, right, reach out to me. And we did have a hyperlocal community group, a Facebook group. So I did put that one in there, but I got nobody on that one on year one. So, oh, well. Year two, I got a couple of people that started being like, oh, I'm in this little red triangle. You know, I, I would like to participate. So I started widening my reach a little bit and it started growing a lot. So, so walk me. So, okay, cool. You, you got a community event. You got your flyers out. You're starting to put some stuff on Facebook. People are recognizing you because I'm sure on the bottom of the flyer, it says that your company name and you know, obviously you sell real estate and things of that nature. So people knew you're in real estate. How do you convert a bunch of randoms that are holding a garage sale at their own property? And it could be a couple houses down, maybe a half a block away. How are you able to take that traffic and convert clients out of it? Because I think that's what pe- people are like, okay, we, we understand the concept of map, flyers, run. Okay. Good running shoes. I think they got that down. Um, how are you able to take those people from let's do a community event to an actual client? Okay. So the garage sale itself is the catalyst, if you want, to really start the process. When okay. people are looking to sell their houses, their houses are lived in, they're way too full with stuff. What's the first thing a real estate agent says? You need to declutter. You have way too many things in here. And they don't look to take all these things with them. So when they are in the process of figuring out, okay, like what do I take? What do I not take? And um, the process of donating the things that you don't want anymore, you have to go load it in your car and you have to go drive it to the place you want to donate it to. 
and then you have to donate it so you don't even get anything out of it and you lost your time and the money and gas keep on going right so what if you reverse the prospect process and say well rather than you doing that tell people to come to your house pay you for the things you don't want anymore take it from you and you make money in the process of it and your house gets emptied so now you have to move less of the stuff that you don't want to move with you and make money along the way that can now fund your moving expenses as we all know they're astronomically high so if you want to move right you gotta have to kind of figure that one out so why not make some money on top of it and also lighten your own load without putting all of this work on you and you have to go through it anyhow if you want to go donate it you have to go through it so why not just pull it out and then put it inside the garage sale prior to so that is the one thing you also start um, fishing a lot higher up instead of the now business so as a geographic farmer, it's all about relationships. So for me, it's a matter of where do I start my relationship? My relationship should start as far upstream as I possibly can in order for me to start that, you know, relationship building part of it. So I I, I want to I just want to interject and pause here a little bit. You weren't trying to get rich quick with this strategy. Well, aren't we all trying to find the strategy that works? But no, I, well, I think we're trying to find <laughs> I think agents are. I think a lot of agents are stuck because, um, you know, we, we know the industry. Right. Now business. We, we need now. Like, I don't even know what the F that means, because 80 percent of the people that walk through our office door, we're like, oh, we're six months out. Oh, we're nine months out. And then we start a conversation. We ask some questions and you realize you're actually like 60 days out. And the people that come in, oh, we're ready to buy. Those are the ones that are like. The, the now buyers tend to be nine months out and the nine months buyers tend to be the now buyers is what we found um, a lot of. But you weren't using this as a one time. I'm going to test it out for a couple of months. This was like, I'm going to do this. I'm I'm smart. I know that people that need to move are going to start decluttering. So why don't I get in the process early on? As Sharon always says, the person who gets in there early is typically the person who they use. So this was kind of like a long-term strategy in your mind. It was a long-term strategy in terms of I knew I was not going to give up on it because okay. worst case scenario, I like garage sales. I I like to, you know, I mean, there, there's just, it was my personal gain out of it to go to a hundred sales in a weekend without all the crazy driving. And the cool thing is if you're hosted, sometimes people are like, hey, you can just take it. And I'm like, Awesome. So, you know, there's those little hidden perks, totally. But it's a great way to also do market research on the people that live there because conversations is what drives our business, right? So knowing what are your pain points, knowing like what keeps them up at night, knowing where are the problems coming in that they're facing, you can't get that unless you either have a ton of business to rely on where you had conversations with them. For me, being new when I started, I didn't have that. So I needed to figure out what kept them up at night. I also needed to figure out what is super important to them. I can tell you my ideal client in my farm, they love gardening. They're huge into family. They have all their kids' crap still in the basement because the kids have houses <laughs> of their own, families of their own, and they don't take it with them. You know, so I mean, I can really start telling you all about my ideal person because I had conversation. So yes, even as an introvert, I have conversations, just not, you know. So, so I have a I have a question here because uh, you mentioned you started in early childhood education. How did you make the jump from like you're you're speaking a lot of marketing terminology, a lot of uh, you know, yeah, like just a lot of marketing terminology. Like, where did you gather this information? Because I think a lot of people get into real estate, uh, and we have tons of conversations, Vic and I with real estate agents that don't necessarily have the information to even understand what a geographic farm is, or even to understand, uh, maybe they just end up in a crappy office to begin with, and they don't have the, the, they don't have the means in order to get the information around how to even find an ideal avatar or find an ideal audience. How did you, when you started in the business, did you, did you know this stuff or was this like, did this stuff come intuitively to you or where did you get that information in order to create the strategic process for your business? Education. Again, um, as you know, a teacher, you seek information and the information in the real estate industry is, is terrible. That's out there. I mean, once you get your license, right, that's it. Um, the degree in marketing, there's no degree, by the way. There's literally no degree. I didn't 
study any of it came all based on researching webinars, podcasts, listening to people smarter than me, right? And then from there, it just went into all the things. I mean, literally all the things from retargeting and funnels and, and all all the things that I think somebody should have a basic knowledge for, for running a small business. Because at the end of the day, real estate is, you know, what we what we do, but we are small business owners. So as a small business owners, how many hats are we wearing in our business? And then get, well, there's too many, but then you have to have certain knowledge of it in order to know if you do end up hiring for that position, is the person that you are hiring knowing what they're talking about or are they BSing you in so many wor words, right? So you do need to have that general knowledge on so many of the hats before I give my hat to somebody else. And that was, I think, something that I just started early on. It was always, how can I learn more? Watch what somebody else was doing. Why are they doing it? How can I learn about it? What's the reason behind it? I'm a big white person. Um, and it just, it made sense then piecing it together. But yeah, there's nobody that pieces it together for you. It's all based on self-driven education if you're on a real estate business. You know, one of my friends, um, they run a huge, huge team out of uh, North Florida. You know, they're going to do like 3,500, 4,000 transactions, billion dollars in, in sales this year. And she posted something, uh, Lindsay posted something on her Facebook. She said, in the information age that we're in, if you don't, if you can't find the information, does that make you just lazy or stupid? And it's really the truth. Like I was talking to an agent. I don't think I told you about this, Cody, on Monday or Tuesday of this week, or maybe last week. And I said, what's your average commission? And she says, well, I don't know. I said, okay, what's your average sales price? I don't know. What's the... Then I was like, if you don't know your average sales price, you've only done three deals. It's not like rocket science here. You 500, 300, 200, a million divided by three. I mean, it's, it's like basic math here. And I said, what's your median sales price in your, in your community? And she goes, I don't know. And she was on a team. And Cody, it, like my eyeballs popped out like Cody's. And it's like agents don't even know that they're a small business, which is one of the major problems. So it's like, if you don't like going back to your answer, your, your question, Cody, you have to have that internally inside of you to be a knowledge seeker, because if you don't, you're just going to be like, well, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And then you fail and it's the market's fault. No, it's not. You didn't even know your median sales price. Um, let, let, let's go back, Janine, to you, you have some numbers for us, right? I do have some numbers for you. Yes. So let's go to your last two open houses. Can you break it down like in a in a case study? Because we're kind of coming up on time here and I want to jump into some of the numbers. So can you break it down like a case study? You printed up how many flyers you started marketing, how much in advance you use, what different websites, if you have that information, like if you could just rattle off some things that you're doing. Um, and obviously you guys, she's in year seven or eight of doing this. So we wouldn't expect you in year one to have as consistent of a strategy, but um, can we just like dive into the numbers? Sure. So I'm on year nine, little correction, that's okay. You okay, forgive. sorry. Just kidding. But year nine, okay? So year nine, I walked away with five listings on the market. I'm, I'm saying on the market because there's still an entire pipeline filled with people I had conversations with ready to list within a year or two, right? And that's okay. part of the reason I wanna start fishing upstream is because these opportunities start trickling down and there's going to be more and more and more. But that's the actual business component of it. So I ended up with five signed listing agreements for that one. Um, I added 700 people into my database in one weekend. Okay. One weekend. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Two days, I had 700 people. Now, not all 700 people are transacting, but when I look at my business model, everything I do is built on scale. Okay. I do postcards, um, I do email marketing, and I do events. I don't do one-on-one. -on -one. My lifestyle is not structured for one-on-one -on -one interactions other than if you are a buyer of mine or a seller of mine. So those are the only, you know, all my family. Those are the only one-on-one -on -one interactions I do. Everything is structured at scale, including database intake, building relationships on my email, um, marketing, and then converting them at events. Might that be by garage sale like we talked about? Might that be asking them to come on over for an open house and have interactions with me face to face, right? Um, so five, 700 new people into my database for that one weekend, um, 172 contacts inside my geographic farm, 
Now, these contacts are also people that have willingly given me their contact information. I have their address. I have their email. Um, many times I do get a phone number for them that I typically don't use until they become clients. But there is all that data that was willingly given to me that now allows me to be of value to them inside the farm so they don't just get followed up with of like, hey, are you looking to buy and sell, right? Like right. it's really um, personal marketing because there's a real person behind it. And for them to see a real person is that trust factor that I need for them to say, you know what, here's where we're at. We don't know where to start because it takes time for another human being to get that trust to say, come on into my house. It's not ready yet. And many of my clients take pride in how their house looks. They don't want somebody over if it's not looking good. You know, they apologize the minute that you come in the door and they're like, I'm sorry, it's not perfect. And that's just people want, want perfection and what they really need is help, right? So breaking so with yeah, breaking down the 700 emails, because like, I think that this is super important. How much did you, how much was your marketing budget for the yeah. event? Like how much did you spend on mailers? How much did you spend in order to uh, attract those 700 Okay, so now we're talking year nine, okay? So from z year zero to year nine, there is a difference. Um, my farm has grown. I currently market 5,000 houses yeah. from, a, from a farm perspective. And these 5,000, I think the mailers are like 1,800 bucks. Okay, yeah. so I sent out that one mailer. I did break into a new farm this year, so we did add an additional letter that normally we don't send, but because we wanted to make sure we have enough signups in year one on that particular area, which we did, we tripled what we were, you know, hoping for, almost tripled. So it works, but well, let's just let let's just focus on your main farm, because um, that uh, you know, otherwise we're getting too too many numbers. So your main farm, you send out five thousand flyers. What well, thirty five hundred? So the main one is yeah. thirty five hundred homes. So the main one is thirty five, and the secondary one is fifteen. Right. Hundreds. So focus okay. on the main one. So we okay. have um thirty five hundred homes that okay. have seen my face again, right, in front of them. Um, we do had hundred and seventy two people register. That's what you so so when so how much time do you prep for the for the um so your your flyer goes out July first. When is your yeah. open house event? Right. So right now this entire event, because I have you know, so many people registering is an eight week production time frame. Okay. So if you look at how it's broken out, the first three to four weeks, we typically just gauge the interest of how many of the past recipient or like past participants want to sign up again, right? Um, so we have our flyers go into production and we tell them, hey, we're doing another garage sale because I hold an email list. We utilize the email list in right. addition to obviously the postcards. So it's just based on, hey, we're going to do it again. Here are the dates. Can you sign up? Great. We'll get them over to our registration form. Now, the registration from year zero was email me. The registration in year nine is go through our form, right? So we right. drive them over a Google form where a lot of that process is automated at this point because there's so many of them in my business group. So I don't have time to be doing one by one email importing like I did year zero. Things grow, things change. We always added more things along the way where now it's down to a system that I can just simply replicate. The cost, because we added like banners, we added signs, we added other things, but the cost of it is not every new year I have the same cost because I store it, right? There's a lot of storage stuff involved in banner. Well, um, what would you say your your promotion costs are for you know, like how much, how much would you say you invest um, in your promotion cost? Because a lot of it, you know, is reusable. So the banners, the, you know, the signs, the flags, things like that. How much do you think you've invested in like the last two or three years? I probably come up in like this point at like 2000 because I just had to order. So it's super minimal. It's super cheap. I mean, consider okay. I know how much it is. Um, overall, the event might run me that, you know, if I... Like so your all, event all, costs are your your event costs to do it the right way are somewhere between two to three thousand bucks. I'd say probably less than two. Okay, that's and that, crazy. That's was wrap up. That's was you know sending out the follow up because we just had our ice cream social to kind of bring it all to a conclusion. Say so you did the work, you made the money. Let me treat you now for ice cream. So, so you I, bring an ice cream truck to the neighborhood. 
Um, we actually have a local Dairy Queen. So I invite all of them to support that local business. Got or it. Dairy Queen. And the turnout yesterday was amazing. So we just had it yesterday. And again, it's another touch point for me to just really make sure we bring down the community. We'll, you know, have fun together. And it puts my business in a in a spotlight of positive community interaction that has served my business just extremely well. So if we break this down, so if somebody wants to get into this, they could start out essentially with a bunch of flyers, a couple hundred flyers, 250, 500. You could map out your neighborhood that you want to focus on. You could drop the flyers. You don't even have to talk to people. If you want to go super basic, you can put email me or text me. If you want to get into a little bit more fancy, you could do like a jot form and they would fill out the information, a couple of basic questions, name, address, phone number, you know, with the dates, you know, maybe put a couple dates on there, whatever. So people have a choice, what works better. And then from there, now you have some information. You've already collected some data points. You've got to know a couple of the neighbors, maybe two or three, maybe, maybe 10, right? Depending on how big and if you've done any transactions there, you don't really need a lot of startup costs because you just need to be there and have like a map. So you could probably print up a bunch of maps in your office. So, so really like to do the first one, an agent could essentially four to six weeks of prep time and a couple of hundred dollars with their office printer. And then, you know, maybe 20, 25 hours of actual like leg work of dropping off flyers to a couple hours of meeting different people, if whatever they want. And then, you know, a couple hours of doing the garage sale on that Saturday or Sunday. Yeah. If somebody's willing to put in actual work and, you know, do all those things. Yeah. It's doable. And it, and it, I mean, I don't know about you, Cody, but it, this seems like one of the easier ways, not the fastest way, but one of the easier ways, if you're willing to look at it from a long-term point of view, to really break into a neighborhood relatively inexpensively. Oh, a hundred percent. Like, you know, I know Jean, uh, Jeanine, prior to you were, you were saying like, oh, like everyone knows about this. I don't know. Like this is, this is a new, this is a totally different strategy. Like we've done yeah. 150. 50 episodes now and I've, I haven't heard one people one person bring up this strategy so yeah you know <laughs> we did a lot yeah. of door knocking a lot of cold calls we sold hundreds of millions of dollars of the real estate i don't know that i ever heard the garage sale tactic yeah so you know i uh, janine i just want you know closing out here i just want to say thank you more than anything i wanted to say thank you for breaking this for really breaking this down and giving you know so much value back to the real estate community we're in a we're in a uh, in a market right now where people are looking for different solutions in order to grow their business. And I think that this is really cool. Like, like Vic said, I don't think that this is a, this is definitely not a short-term fix for a business, but like, this is something that could really make you almost like the, the mayor of that little community. So it's really cool to see if somebody were to want to reach out to you and they want to have, a, maybe they want to have a conversation, pick your brain. Uh, maybe they, maybe it's an agent to agent referral in that local market. Uh, maybe they want. Maybe to they somebody. want to partner. Maybe they want to partner yeah. with you. We're just gonna get throw some ideas. Maybe maybe there's an agent in the Chicago area that would love this, and they want to partner with you, and they can just give you a a commission split on any deals that you guys bring in. I don't know. Just throwing things out yeah. there. Just throwing things out there. Where is the best place that we can send them to have a conversation with you? So the best way is probably just to find me on Facebook. Send me a friend request. It's Janine Sasso. Um, you can also find us under the hyper local agent. The hyperlocal agent is where, you know, we do share a lot of the hyperlocal strategies and, you know, garage sale is one. Um, and again, we can continue on with shredding events, mini golf tournaments. I mean, there's just so, so much, much that you can do. Well, really. a lot of, Janine, a lot of people talk about the, uh, the shredding event. So I hear about the shredding event a lot and I hear a lot about the um, throwaway, like the electronics, but this is, I think the first for the garage sale. Because you make yeah. the money. You make the money before you even ask them to sign on the dotted line. To yeah, pay it's, great. it's crazy. And you're doing all the marketing. So it, it just, you know, like you get 30 garage sales posting on their Facebook page. You know, you go from 20 people to 600. It's 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 an event. It's an insane event. Yep. We turn it into a spectacle. So we get people from, you know, five different states arriving, surrounding us because it's there's an entire community out there of people loving giant garage sales. That's great. It's amazing. Uh, so, so many, so such a great tactic. Uh, yeah. And uh, I want to say thank you, Virginia, for joining us on the Origin podcast today. 
And I want to say thank you for tuning into another episode of the number one real estate podcast in the world. We'll see you soon. 